Uh, so let me just say hello and welcome to Velo Virtual. Uh, this is Velo 3D's application deep dive webinar series. Uh, today we're talking about a new topic, something we've never really gone down and talked about before, uh, downhole drill bits. So really excited to be here today. Um, this is a session that has everything. So I think you're going to really enjoy this one. This has topological optimization, advanced simulation. It has metal additive manufacturing. Um, some of the smartest engineers that I've had a chance to talk to doing some amazing work all combined together to make one great story. You know, we tend to talk about heat exchangers in metal additive. We talk about rocket propulsion aviation. Uh, but until now, we really haven't talked about parts for the oil and gas industry, specifically drilling. Uh, so this, this is going to be a really good one. Um, in drilling, you know, we, we look at optimization. We, we look at the challenge of optimizing parts. And in this context, optimization means a higher rate of penetration of the rock substrate. Um, it's also a longer lasting drill bit. So this is about reliability as well. And, and current designs, uh, they're optimized for hydraulics, make no mistake about that, but they're also designed to be manufactured by conventional means. And in our experience, what this usually indicates is that there's potential left on the table. And when we see that, we get excited, right? So analyzing the results of modern topological optimization, CFD, designers at CDS found that room for improvement. And they have updated this design by updating their manufacturing technology. And they are leveraging the geometric freedoms created by advanced metal ladder manufacturing, or you may also know this as metal 3D printing. So today we're joined by CDS, ANSYS, and Bell 3D engineers for a look at how that synergy of modern software, advanced manufacturing, can unlock these new capabilities for parts like downhole drill bits, estimated to be a $5 billion market by 2026. So a uh, really, really great opportunity here. Now, let me introduce our speakers today. Uh, it is an honor to have on our show, uh, Rushik Matroja. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer with seven years of experience in additive manufacturing, mainly in Japan. He has worked on more than 100 different engineering projects regarding AM. Uh, he is a CATIA champion and one of the first people to introduce in topology to Japan. Now, he is the CEO of Cognitive Design Systems, a startup creating innovative solutions to automate and accelerate your design workflows for added manufacturing. Dr. Sunil Acharya um, is an engineering simulation expert with 21 years of industry experience in simulation-based techniques for product design and process modeling. As a lead application engineer for the ANSYS Customer Excellence, or ACE, team, Sunil's primary area of expertise is in materials and multi-physics modeling. Sunil is a mechanical engineer from IIT in Bombay with a PhD in polymer engineering and an MS in biomedical engineering from the University of Akron. Sunil is a member of NAFMES. I'm sure there's a better way to say that, uh, but I'll let you pronounce it. Manufacturing Simulations Working Group and the Digital Twin Consortium. It's NAFIMS. I, I knew there was a better way to say it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, last but not least is Matt Kirsch. Uh, he's a technical sales engineer at Velo 3D. As a technical sales engineer, Matt specializes in helping companies get the most out of Velo 3D capabilities for their in part applications. So, not how to use the printer, but actually how to use these printers to solve your engineering problems. Uh, he started his career in backup power generation before moving to commercial aviation. He has worked on high pressure turbine deblate designs. Um, he's worked specifically in additive manufacturing since 2017 and has experience in several disciplines, including laser powder bed fusion, uh, e-beam, binder jetting. His previous roles include companies like GE Aviation and Caterpillar. Uh, he is also a hell of an engineer and holds a BS in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech. So, Rishik, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, um, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for, for joining us. Um, today we are going to talk about uh, um, a very uh, special part called the PDC drill bit. PDC stands for uh, polycrystalline diamond compact uh, uh, and the drill bits. Um, it's used in the oil and gas industry um, in order to for the for the soft 
medium to, to hard soil uh, for the extraction of, uh, of uh, various uh, uh, gases or, or oils. Um, and uh, the part itself is already a very highly complex part. Uh, and it, it really makes sense uh, to, to, to think about additive by looking at the part. But um, the part currently has been optimized uh, in, for hydraulics for, uh, for the conventional manufacturing processes. And uh, today we are going to, to explore even further what are the, the, the current issues with this part, um, how it is, and how we can improve it. Um, just for a reminder, this part is a very expensive part, so it, it actually makes a lot of sense to, to, to think about uh, going to additive. In order to do that, uh, first of all, uh, I will be doing uh, multiple different uh, optimization processes. Uh, first of all, uh, we will do a CFD analysis, uh, mechanical analysis, and uh, uh, with uh, ANSYS uh, fluent. Um, in order to understand better like where the, the problem stands. Um, after that, based on that, that information, we would go to go through topology optimization and we will also optimize the part uh, by, uh, with regarding the, the CFD results. Um, and at the end, we will combine all these different um, optimization results, uh, create a, a single uh, unit and uh, uh, we will improve the, the manufacturability of the part by adding uh, e extra features, um, the, the, the rules of manufacture, additive manufacturing, so DFAM rules, uh, applying some lattice structures where, uh, where it's required. And uh, at the end, we will uh, uh, go through a validation with some uh, for the mechanical stresses. So first of all, to understand better, like what kind of loads uh, are applied on this, this part itself? Um, so as we can we can think uh, uh, that this small bits that you can see, these are the the PDC, and uh, that's where all the the, the cutting is done. Um, a lot of uh, uh, pressure is applied on on that very small section of the of the path, and uh, of course the 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 motion of of, of the turning uh, also generates some kind of uh, the, the load on on, on the path. On top of that, we have an axial load, uh, which is uh, due to the the, the, the whole uh, drilling process, um, and uh, the the various different kind of loads are applied on the the, the bottom surface um, at that part. And uh, at the end, we have a um, um, uh, mud e extraction pressure. So there is a, a jet, um, uh, the water jet, which is uh, which is pumped in. And we try to to extract the the, the mud from the, the the side of of the of the pot. This creates uh, erosion. Uh, there are also a lot of uh, other issues which comes with it. But there is also a lot of internal pressure uh, in the in the pot itself. So we'll be trying to understand that uh, to run uh, through. Uh, we we did uh, um, some CFD analysis uh, uh, to do that. In order to do that, we. Uh, set up our, our our workflow on on uh, um, ANSYS Fluent uh, with uh, with the fluid domain. Uh, we also uh, meshed in a way that it's 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 properly meshed in a way to 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 have a, have the the most uh, accurate results. Um, and we applied the the, the various uh, uh, the flow the the flow related um, um, load cases. Some results uh, regarding uh, all this. So first of all, we have a static pressure, uh, which is mainly, as we can see, it's inside of the pot. So it's it's the it's where the the water jet is, uh, the, the the pressured water is coming coming from. Um, that uh, that part is is highly um, uh, stressed, and uh, uh, the that's where we can maybe we can believe that there there sh there can be. Uh, some uh, erosion uh, could happen due to the to the highly pressured uh, liquid going through it uh, uh, during the whole uh, cutting process. Um, we have the the, the we also measured the uh, the fluid velocity. So once the the, the pressure is coming out, the, the mud extraction the, the the mud will be going upwards. 
um, the the velocity of the the, the fluid will change. Um, and we uh, our main focus here was the to to analyze the the residence time uh, of the fluid. Um, high residence time cause the uh, cause the wear to the path. Um, and at the end, the, the the shear stress that we can imagine with the, the axial load that we we have. Um, which also cause, uh, which is also a cause of uh, of wear. The erosion uh, rate in, in the in the in the part itself, we when we analyzed it, we we saw that there were some some zones where the erosion was happening a lot. This is inside, so this is due to the the the, the water jet, the jet pressure, um, and uh, the outside uh, the the how can it the red zones. Uh, are due to the, the, the high residence uh, time of the fluid. Based on these results, we decided to do uh, uh, topology optimization and uh, fluid optimization. So we divided the, the, the whole problem into two separate problems. So first is the external loads, which are more mainly mechanical loads. Um, we applied it in the, in, the, in the external of the part. We received uh, this uh, 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 topology optimized result. Um, this this uh, was done on N topology. Um, we also did uh, uh, some uh, fluid optimization. So to to have a better uh, the, the the fluid flow uh, the channels in a way that, that we have the the least uh, 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 amount of uh, pressure loss. Um, in order to to have that, we received this kind of, uh, of, of path. Um, we combined them together and it created a, a very organic looking uh, beautiful pot. But um, after all, this is a this is a drill. Uh, this is a uh, this needs to be uh, 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 it cannot have any 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 kind of holes. So what we did is we applied a, a, a shell and uh, we applied inside instead of applying the shell inwards we applied it outwards in a way that uh, the topology optimization result is used as a as a, as as ribbing uh, itself um this whole process uh, created a, a very organic looking this part which is highly complex inside but uh, even from outside we can see uh, all kind of complexity all this uh, uh, boolean operations um, and creating of the shell was done on anthropology uh, by using the, the implicit modeling. Based on the, the, the CFD re result on the, 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 the residence time of the, the fluid, we iterate some designs for the, the, the grooves, which we can see um, the, on the outside. Uh, the original grooves were, are very uh, simple. It's, uh, it's made for the conventional manufacturing process. But instead of that, we 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 improved uh, the the design in a way that the um, the, the fluid flow uh, and the, the groove uh, uh, designs uh, follows each other uh, perfectly. Uh, so this uh, grooves were added uh, on top of it um, uh, in order to 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 have this uh, this organic uh, shape. And at the end, this uh, this the the, the part which was. Uh, Topology optimized and I mean, fluid optimized um, is looking very very different. Uh, and this uh, this all this optimization was uh, due to the the uh, it was a manual optimization process. So we 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 went through the the CFD analysis on ANSYS fluent and we extracted the results um, some point maps of uh, of the, the the at each position each point in the in the in the the um, uh, in the mesh where the the, uh, the what kind of velocity we have and based on that result we we we, we change the, the the geometry in order to have this we also wanted to to reduce the weight of the part itself um because the current weight uh, if we want to manufacture it through additive manufacturing it would be uh it would be a, a, a kind of a, a trouble because that would create a lot of uh, concentration of heat while manufacturing um so in order to reduce the weight and uh, uh, in order to to reduce the the risk of uh, heat concentration we uh, uh, applied the lattice structures in the hollow parts uh, that that were remaining um, and uh, this lattice structures are uh, are cylindrical tpms structures um, which also improve the the, the manufacturability uh, as a whole 
and uh, we don't require any kind of supporting such structures for internal overhangs. Uh, everything was covered thanks to this. Once we have created this kind of internal cavities, we needed to, to evacuate the, 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 the powder uh, because we wanted to produce it with uh, part of it fusion technology. And in order to do that, uh, we, we we created the the, the holes at the, the right position um, in the the top of the part here and the bottom. And in order to to have a uh, um, easily uh, removable uh, powder zones. Um, at the end of that, uh, we we did uh, uh, um, some. Uh, mechanical uh, testing with the worst case scenario and uh, this part yeah uh, first of all yeah this part was manufactured in in in, uh, in Cornell um, so the the maximum form is stress that we, we obtain um, is way below the the in Cornell's uh, yeah, yield strength and uh, uh, we were satisfied with the, with the result as, as, as a globe as, in a whole um, after that, we went to through the the, the manufacturing uh, process analysis uh, with uh, also ANSYS uh, additive manufacturing uh, suit, uh, where we used uh, um, the, the powder bed fusion technology and Inconel uh, as the material itself uh, to 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 go through the the, the manufacturing uh, process itself. Here you can see that the, the part itself was printed in this direction and we can see in the yellow we have a, uh, we have the support structures and the, the part was printed like this. Uh, we'll truly will be talking more about uh, more in detail about uh, how to how they printed the part. Uh, but the simulation of the, of the manufacturing um, was done uh, um, for us to understand the, the, the displacement. Uh, that could occur uh, during the, the manufacturing process. Um, we had uh, uh, we, we we had the, the result. We 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 knew where where, where there is a risk zone. Um, we also had the the formula stresses during the manufacturing process. And uh, here is the uh, um, the result for it. Um, I'm. Um, yeah, uh, there is also one analysis about the the, the blade crash. So the the we believe that uh, as we are using part of it fusion technology, um, there will be a recoater um, blade um, putting the powder, uh, laying it down. Um, and what is the risk to it? As we can see here, that this this part itself has a lot of uh, uh, zones where there is a there is a risk uh, for uh, for the blade crash. So these are these are all the the concerns that we we, we had uh, before the the manufacturing even was done, and uh, we were we were aware aware of the of the issues, and uh, that's where we 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 conducted the uh, Velo 3D and uh, uh, asked for their help and. I pass it over to them. Thanks, Rashik. So where does Velo 3D come into play? Um, they do all of this high analysis, high end analysis, come up with this beautiful design, and then do their build prediction and have some concerns about things like recoder interaction. Um, so just looking at um, the part itself from a high level and where the design stands, uh, the way and what they came up with, um, they've got a lot of complex, both internal and external features with lightweighting lattice, um, geometries, contours, and things like that that would be very difficult to machine um, traditionally and even in your uh, standard additive manufacturing machines. Um, so things like the low angles on the internal channels. Um, and like I mentioned before, the risk for your traditional recoder blade interaction on some of the areas that are predicted to, to warp up, um, which would make um, producing this again in, in your conventional AM machines uh, impossible or difficult if, if not impossible. So what Velo is able to do what we at least attempt to do is preserve the designer's original intent. So the exact design that Rashik is able to come up with, um, keep that as close to original intent as possible. And we do that by using um, our technology that we call support free. And 
not necessarily meaning you can print any geometry that you want without requiring any supports. There are uh, areas that do make sense and types of geometries that do make sense and we are able to print very well without supports, but others that um, don't necessarily make sense and, and still do require post-processing and machining and things like that. Um, so with keeping that in mind and, and trying to preserve that intent and uh, taking advantage of our support-free technology, you got to ask, how are you able to do that? How can you perform those types of uh, operations different than everyone else? And it really comes down to what is kind of I describe as a symphony of uh, tools that we've created. And if we start on the left of the diagram here, it, it starts with our uh, flow software. So our this is our pre-print software where we digest the user's CAD, um, ideally the native CAD uh, out of like a SOLIDWORKS package or an NX package, uh, where we're able to preserve all the surfaces that were originally designed in that CAD package. What that allows us to do is be able to select those surfaces, recognize those surfaces, and if we need to apply special subprocesses or uh, support structures within our uh, preprint software. The other advantage that it gives us is it cuts out any translational error by having to go through uh, your typical STL type file where you lose a lot of the intelligent um, de geometry that you create originally in your native CAD file. So once we have that, uh, that build file prepared in our flow software, that um, is then sliced and creates a print file, which contains all of the laser instructions for the Sapphire printer. Uh, that file is then sent over to the printer itself, which is essentially the hardware that uh, creates these geometries that we're trying to make. Uh, our Sapphire system, and I'll go in a little bit more detail, um, is using two one kilowatt lasers, following all those um, print instructions that we've created in our flow software, and uh, has a couple other kind of unique features that allow us to do what we're doing. So number one, we've, we've approached the hardware uh, more from the um, semiconductor industry where we want to stay very tightly calibrated. Um, and to be able to do that, we want to calibrate uh, often and make calibration easy. So we've set up a suite of calibrations that are click button um, type operations where the operator simply comes up, selects the calibration they want to do, and then walks away and the machine calibrates itself. Um, by having that type of calibration, you can, again, keep your machine calibrated and we recommend doing it weekly or if not before every single build. Um, and then on the back side of that, we put in a ton of metrology where we're monitoring hundreds of data points throughout the entire build uh, to make sure that not only did we set up the machine correctly originally and it's well calibrated, but that it stays within spec um, and stays well calibrated throughout the entire build. Uh, so that that's kind of the first two phases of, okay, we've got our file, we've set up our build, we've created all these laser instructions, we've use that build to go or use that um, print file to go create this geometry in a, in a well um, maintained system. And then the last piece is being able to monitor and report out all the data that we are watching and collecting within the Sapphire system. So that gets into our sure quality software where we're monitoring things like um, O2 levels. We're looking at um, all of our recodes uh, laser alignment, things like that throughout the entire build. And we've got a, a very nice dashboard that gives you a high level summary of the uh, few data points that we think are most critical to describe tool health, but also has the ability to export all of that data from the entire build and manipulate it in whatever way uh, the customer deems uh, necessary. And bringing all this together is kind of our intelligent fusion process that allows us to to really enable support free and maintain as much of that original design intent um, as possible. So getting more into the printer itself, uh, our Sapphire and the one we're referring to here is a 315 millimeter diameter build plate uh, by 400 millimeters tall. It operates two one kilowatt lasers where we are um, using the full one kilowatt capacity to melt our uh, bolt cross sections. 
Um, list of materials on the next slide, so we won't get into that here, but we're, we're generally running 50 micron layers, um, running a argon gas environment, um, and then also have a non-contact recoder, which we'll get into a little bit more later as well. In terms of the, the rest of our, our fleet of printers, if you will, our Sapphire family, we have um, a larger version of the 315 millimeter diameter referred to as the 1MZ, um, standing for essentially one millimeter tall in the Z direction. It is literally the exact same base printer as the Sapphire with just an extended elevator. Um, and then coming out at the end of this year is our Sapphire XC, so our extra capacity machine with a 600 millimeter diameter um, plate that's 550 millimeters tall. Um, it, it's also trying to leverage as much of our original Sapphire hardware as possible. Uh, major difference would be obviously the size, but we're also moving to eight one kilowatt lasers instead of two, uh, but trying to keep those optical trains, the lasers, um, basic mechanics of the machine as close to um, as, as possible of the original Sapphire so that all the process development that we've done early on with our Sapphire and all the ma materials that we've qualified are very easily uh, transferred over to the XE. And what we're seeing so far is that yes, this is indeed the case um, and we are fairly easily and, and quickly able to transfer over parameters to utilize that larger build volume and increase capacity and efficiency of the additional lasers. Some of the materials that we are working with today, uh, two common inconels, the 718 and the 625, a couple of Hastelloys on the Hastelloy X and the C22, uh, TIE 64, Aluminum F357, and Scalmoloy. Uh, in the works, Haynes 282 is actually completed development um, and first machine being uh, pro processed right now to go out to the field. With that material um, and then soon to follow is cop gr cop 42 which is a nasa copper alloy and a stainless steel ca6 and m um, those are kind of our, our on deck uh, materials with a few more in the pipeline that are a little bit farther out um, typically when we're developing a new material what we've seen in our past is uh, your standard development time is approximately three months, depending on how the alloy behaves and how similar it is to some of the other materials we already have developed. Um, some being greater than three months, uh, closer to the six month time frame, but some being uh, significantly shorter in a matter of weeks uh, if they're behaving very similar to something we've already got experience with. Getting back to the design and how we approached it, what we saw and, and what we fed back uh, to Rashik and team uh, initially was brought to us in this orientation, printing the kind of the business end of the bit down towards the plate, uh, which isn't necessarily uh, a bad thing to do. It, it kind of concentrates a, the larger sections of the part down towards the plate. Um, but getting back to trying to preserve the design intent, you're ending up having to support a large amount of area on the bottom of that part. Uh, and you lose a lot of the complex geometry that is built into the additive component, uh, which would then require you to come back and machine all that in, uh, which essentially eliminates the um, improvements and um, capabilities that you're getting by using the additive technology. So understanding the capabilities of our technology, what we can do and how we're able to support some of these more complex features, we suggested rotating it 180 degrees, printing with the thread end down to the plate and um, growing everything else up, of, up off of that, which allowed us to kind of maintain, like I mentioned, the design intent of those complex features up at the top, but also eliminate essentially all of the support material, uh, both outside and inside of the part. In terms of capabilities from a generalized standpoint um, and what, what we think of when we are trying to uh, look at your parts and understand what is and what is not um, possible to do on our printers today. Uh, things like dome closures, where we're looking at uh, the ability to build those types of features at diameters of a, greater than 100 millimeters um, and can approach angles um, at approximately zero degrees at the top of those closures. Uh, horizontal tubes, so pure horizontal can get uh, maximum internal diameters of 100 millimeters. Uh, and really the challenging component of those types of 
features is that close out at the very top. Um, but on the small side, we're able to still resolve a 500 micron feature um, of a horizontal tube. Uh, when we modify that tube slightly and give it a small angle and tilt it up, you change the physics of the way that geometry is closing out and uh, becomes more advantageous for the printing process. So we are able to greatly or significantly increase our maximum internal diameter above 100 millimeters. Uh, while still maintaining that minimum internal diameter of 500 microns. And then lastly, just horizontal spans, um, essentially constrained on two sides and unconstrained on the other two, looking at maximum spans of approximately 10 millimeters um, and then minimum down to 250 microns. So keeping all these generalized features in mind, we then kind of digest that into the, the design um, and what we're able to do in an actual functional component. So here's a, a good example of essentially what would be like a shrouded impeller with a three degree roof. Um, and what you're seeing is the bottom side of the part here that was built and then cut directly off the plate. Uh, all the, the veins were connected to the plate with the roofs in between the veins, uh, again, running at that three degree kind of from the out to the in. Um, unsupported. So no post-processing or surface finishing has been completed on this part. It was um, literally just cut off the plate, flipped over, and then the picture is the result of what you can see here. And rough scale um, of the person holding that in, in the left side. So really strong ability to, to be able to print at, at a high surface quality and um, generally fairly good surface finish at um, extremely low angles uh, in these types of features. And then taking the part that Rashik and team provided to us, um, still doing a couple tweaks to improve or, or optimize what the printer can and um, is able to produce. So just moving from top to bottom, uh, trying to remove a lot of the sharp transitions that are in the drill body. Um, hopefully you can see my cursor, but uh, we had this one that, that actually dips down negative and then comes back up. So taking a nice smooth blend through there, um, adding the powder holes like Rashik mentioned, and then utilizing those parameters that we have to maintain that small diameter uh, relative to the large cross section around it so that the powder can still effectively be removed. Um, doing things like blending these shelves in down here, which in an area that is uh, likely going to be machined anyways, uh, not adding a ton of value by uh, invoking our low angle process. So just adding a little bit of stock there to, to build as is supported off of itself. Same with the threads. Um, we have the ability to print threads in, but uh, from a realistic standpoint and a applicable standpoint of using threads in in a functional application, you're still gonna want to machine those threads um, to have a good machine surface quality and um, capable thread. So adding the stock there and having that be machined in after the fact, fairly simple operation and um, gives the most uh, capability in that type of feature. And then lastly, fairly simple stock added to the bottom of the part with a fillet to prevent a sharp transition and potential for cracking at that initialization point on the build plate. So Rashik also had mentioned some of the, the stress prediction during printing and, and what they had run is for uh, you, what you can think of as more of your traditional AM system with a fixed blade recoder. Um, so every area in red is predicting a level of deformation and um, a recoder interaction that would happen on those types of systems. So they've come up with this great geometry, all this functionality, um, but now are at risk to be able to produce that on, on a traditional AM system. What Velo is able to do is kind of a, a two-prong approach. One is take our process parameters and inherently reduce the level of risk or, or the level of stress that accumulates in those types of features. So bring that overall um, potential for uh, peeling and uh, distortion down. And then the next thing that we have and are able to do is utilize our non-contact recoder to eliminate the uh, physical interaction at the build plane between a, a recoder blade and the part geometry itself.
to give a little bit more insight in what is happening with that non-contact non recoder, you can think of it as, as kind of a three-stage process where we move over the build and we drop uh, significantly more powder than what is required for our build layer. And recall, we're building at 50 micron layers. So on the order of a couple millimeters is how much powder we're dropping. Um, then we come back with a fixed blade and normalize that surface, uh, but still significantly higher than what our, uh, our final build thickness is. So on the order of 500 microns to a millimeter. And then um, the last step would be the proprietary removal process where we're without contacting the, the bed, removing the powder, the last bit of powder to get down to that very precise and final 50 micron layer. So using this process, we have the ability to um, tolerate geometries that tend to want to peel up and interact with the recoder or geometries that are, are very susceptible. Think of things like heat exchanger fins and very thin walls, high aspect ratio geometry that um, have have potential to be damaged or distorted or or bent by some sort of physical recode mechanism mechanism that would interact at that that level. And then on the inspection side of of the recode, we have this height mapper um, tool. And what we're doing here is is taking two types of images. One is like your standard image that you would take every day on your phone. Um, which we take both before and after um, each layer. And then at the same time, doing a uh, structured light scan to create a 2D topological map to understand how the actual uh, powder bed is laid down and what the resulting surface looks like. So by having this scan, we can see if there's any um, abnormalities or anomalies with the recoat that we've done and how we've spread that powder, if there's some sort of issue and how it was spread. Um, also, we can see if the geometry is misbehaving at all and protruding out of the bed. So an example here, you'll see the, the Velo logo um, in the left image, everything is great. In the right image, what we're detecting is a protrusion. And what has actually happened here is um, something below the build layer has become disjointed and powder was flicked up. So the protrusion that is identified, which is well over 500 microns, is actually a clump of powder, not actual lased metal. But by having that structured light scan, we're able to say, OK, there is something above a, a threshold that we deem safe to continue to build, have the operator come inspect. Uh, they came by, they saw, OK, this is just a clump of powder, do a couple more recoats, smooth it back down, and continue on. Um, with that approach, we can not only A, protect the printer and the hardware itself, but understand if things are going wrong with the geometry as we're building it, and if something needs to be changed or corrected. So very powerful tool, um, both in process and after the fact to help diagnose issues uh, with printer and build. And then what we've got here is, um, just an image of we're, we're scrolling through in the Z direction of our build in our preprint software. So you're seeing as essentially it would be built in the machine, progressing up through the layers. Um, down in the base here, we've got our build plate stock, and then we grow out into the more complex TPMS internal structures where we've done the, the not we, but Rashik and team have done the light weighting and um, added some stiffness to their overall part that grows and you start to incorporate those complex external features and um, closing out some of those low angle channels. And then finally, um, close off the build at the very top. So a couple of things to note in this software on the left is, is where we brought in the geometry. Again, the native CAD where we can still recognize all those surfaces. And here's where we have the ability to come select those surfaces and apply any sort of special process that we deem necessary. Um, we can also come in and add support structures. So on the bottom there, the, the section of geometry shown in blue is a support that's been added in the flow preprint software where we've selected the bottom of the part, said extrude this much material down and add a fillet of radius X uh, to the build plate to make sure we've got good adhesion and we don't crack off of the plate. So, 
very powerful piece of software. Um, I, and again, it's the, the initial piece that allows us to progress through this whole complex process. Within that um, flow software, like I mentioned, we can go um, put in specialized processes, but in general, we've got a, a very um, extensive list of generalized processes that uh, automatically are applied, that flow is able to recognize based on the feature type, um, angle, and things like that. Uh, to the geometry to build successfully. So some of the examples pointed out here, the top facing contours and, and being able to resolve a lot of those um, uh, features there, and then also bulk materials. So in some of the thicker sections of the part where we're applying that full one kilowatt melted core, um, we also have different processes for low angles and, and some of the closeouts on the internal structures. Um, again, maintaining the small hole diameters for the powder removal and making sure that hole stays clear and um, as defined in the CAD. And then traditional vertical wall contours and things like that for more of your normal type geometries. Um, all of these types of features are apply, recognized and applied automatically in our flow preprint software. So then what are we able to do with all that information and not only print it on a, a single kind of R&D machine, what we can do with the way we've set up our, our build files, our software and our machines by keeping all of this generalized, keeping it all um, kind of on the same page, having our machines all calibrate the same way and calibrate um, often is we can create what we refer to as a, a golden build file. So create that preprint file, go slice it, develop those print instructions. And then you can then take that build file, put it on any Sapphire printer in anywhere in the world, and you should be able to recreate the exact same results um, regardless of location or printer serial number, which is extremely powerful thing to do and um, traditionally uh, very difficult to do with uh, manual calibrations and offsets uh, for different laser powers and things like that on, on different machines and different serial numbers, where we've tried to really take a productionized focus on, on our machine and our technology uh, to be able to do that so that, you know, if you did need to do some sort of distributed manufacturing, or let's say you don't want to own a machine yourself, but want the ability to go out to our contract manufacturing network and have all of them quote on your part, it only takes one file, one setup, um, significantly reducing the NRE and giving the, the customer the, and the user um, a much greater ability and flexibility in their supply chain. And what we got here is actually a compilation of the actual uh, height mapper images. So I mentioned we took two types of images. One are regular camera images, which is what we're seeing here. And the other is the, the 2D topological images. Um, and this is just playing, you stitch all those images through, play them through like a video, and you can see this uh, build progress as if you were um, sweeping through the CAD itself. And so you get all those different features. You see the complex internal channels, the, the closeouts, the, the external contours, um, a pretty, pretty neat way to see this part come together. And then what we end up with is a final print. So um, the parts shown here on the right, Again, with, with the complex internal channels, uh, complex out uh, external contours, um, quite, a, quite a good print uh, and, and good results. Uh, and then what's up next for this part is really to do just the final machining like we mentioned. So cut in a lot of those threads, um, maybe clean up some of that bottom surface and then inspect the part and, and make sure it was produced to the original design intent uh, that Rashik and team had come up with. So I think I'll hand it back to Rashik here. Yeah, so um, thank you very much. It was, it was pretty awesome to, to, to see all this uh, happening. Um, in this day, the, the, the topology optimization or um, the, how can I say, the uh, new software is coming up, uh, such as N-topology with all the, the implicit modeling have created a, 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 a great opportunity on the design side that we can explore the, the design spectrum uh, like never before. But now the issue is there is manufacturing and, and um, Velo3D uh, is, uh, is, is right there to able to, to actually convert that, uh, that uh, 
the complex geometries uh, into uh, manufacturable parts. So it's it's a really a good uh, good combination of both, both technologies uh, on design and manufacturing side. Uh, we are really moving forward. Uh, some takeaways from uh, from this uh, this whole project, of course, we we improved uh, weight, uh, we improved the performance in terms of uh, of the the, the flow, um, and we improved the manufacturability of the part itself. Um, we the the residence time of the of the, the fluid which is uh, uh, which is being extracted uh, is is way lower. There is less issues of uh, of uh, of uh, wearing and uh, um, and that that makes uh, uh, the part um, uh, the the right uh, uh, how can I say a, a very really optimized part. Um, and of course, uh, compared to the before, I will let uh, Velo 3D answer on the, I, I saw a few questions regarding the, the, the cost. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, cost has came down dramatically from before. Uh, that's something that I can, I can say for sure. And uh, yeah, if uh, some of you guys are coming over to, to form next, uh, I will be there uh, with Velo 3D also, who will be presenting there. Um, don't hesitate to, uh, to, to ping me, uh, send me a message, uh, or send any any of us uh, a message, and we will try to to catch up and and answer uh, further questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I pass it on to yeah, Trady. I'm going to take questions now. We do have a couple questions that came in while the presentation was going on, so uh, we will jump through those. Uh, the first question I'll go ahead and take, and and that was about, uh, will you be getting a copy of this session? So we did record the session. We will be posting it. We'll provide you a direct link to the recording. Uh, we do not typically give the, a PDF copy, but if you want to watch the recording with the speaker actually presenting, uh, you'll get the full story that way. So just, just a way to kind of preserve the integrity of the content. Um, and so I will ask a couple questions, sort of in the order that they came in. Um, one of the questions, and, and Sunil, maybe this is for you, is regarding this part, there was a lot of talk about simulation. Uh, was fatigue life taken into account? Yeah, that was a very good question. Uh, and I'm going to answer a couple of related questions from uh, the gentleman who asked this question as well. So uh, we haven't done detailed fatigue life analysis yet on this part, but here are some of the thoughts. First of all, when we were doing the um, comparative stress analysis uh, from before and after uh, weight reduction type of an comparative analysis, we noticed that the stresses in the, um, the new design um, under the loading conditions are fairly small. So that, that's a good sign as far as uh, the fatigue life itself. Um, the la some of the lattice, we use uh, some, something from gyroid uh, class of lattices, and that is typically uh, good for fatigue. Uh, that's uh, that's what people in literature are finding out. Uh, we've also added more area and optimized the flow, the coolant flow around the whole part, so that should help keeping the temperatures down. Uh, but last but not least, we have to also think about uh, porosity in the part, and I, I, you know, those are all the issues that. Um, we, we have to uh, look into this. Uh, we've done other parts that are really complex, gyroids uh, similar to this, uh, or even more complex, and where we were able to print them with very minimal porosity or no porosity that would affect the uh, mechanical integrity. So uh, we're hopeful that we'll be able to uh, converge towards a solution, but uh, that's all on the paper. We'll definitely like to uh, take the design to field and see how it compares, right? So those are extremely valid questions and Rashik's uh, team has great experience in the area of tooling and additive. And uh, this is just an extension of that work. We, you know, we uh, got our toes wet in those examples that Rashik has um, experience with. And this is the next one, uh, which, uh, you know, is definitely interesting to a lot of people. Uh, just know that the bits, the idea is not to put the bits uh, as part of the additive. That's that's going to be impossible. Uh, they need to, to be uh, welded or brazed uh, as a post-processing operation. Uh, but the idea is uh, if you're in the middle of an ocean platform and you need a new bit, um, can I print one quickly and make it work? And I think 
we're pretty confident that this, this type of approach will work. Uh, it'll need more validation from um, some of these uh, interesting questions or, or interesting issues that you raised. Uh, They're definitely going to be important for their life and whatnot. But uh, I think it's a you've got uh, great signs for success in the field. Yeah, and, and there was a question here, um, and it'll probably help to create a little bit of context on where we are with this part. Um, you know, was this part finished and run on a rig yet? Is is the question? Um, and and maybe uh, maybe Matt, since you're probably the last one to, to have seen or touch this part, where are we with this part in terms of its um, development? So my understanding, it, it's been printed, and um, next up would be to do some inspections, make sure dimensionals are coming in as intended, and um, yeah, I'll maybe do some of that that machining that we mentioned. Um, I'd I'd maybe Rashik or Sunil can can give some more color on what happens after that. We'll we'll definitely be uh, interested in finding partners that can help us test this. I'm sure Rashik has some ideas and partners, but we're we're looking in that area uh, as well. Yeah and, and, yeah, and we do intend to take this part to form next. It will be a printed part. Uh, but none of the finishing steps have happened yet. So we, we want to get this out and, and give everybody, everybody a chance to see it and touch it. Um, but all of the finishing and, and like what Matt mentioned, the threads like that, that we printed without any threads, um, that that's a post-processing application, uh, putting on the teeth would be something that would need to be done in post. So all of that stuff is still to be determined. So kind of stay tuned. <laughs> There's probably a part two of this story, uh, maybe brewing in the works here. And Rishik, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, definitely. This is the, I mean, uh, doing the the, the experimental uh, analysis on on the, on the the real part is is the is the the end goal of the of this project. Um, finding the the right partner and right uh, right people to to work on uh, would be the the, the key right now. Um, but uh, on the same time, um, not just questioning the. The, the 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 drill bit itself, but it, it it's it's an exploration of uh, what is feasible uh, with the with the new design technologies and with new manufacturing technologies, and uh, this is just a starting point that where we can we can expand uh, way more our uh, uh, our further uh, uh, design exploration process uh, uh, for other industries also. Uh, not only the, the oil and gas, but it could be applied to the aerospace, uh, uh, automotive, uh, where we, we, we are required to do mechanical uh, uh, CFD analysis uh, and uh, fatigue analysis. And all this uh, uh, should be done, uh, um, keep in mind that this kind of designs are feasible and manufacturable now. And there was a question uh, regarding the supports, and Matt, this is probably good for you. Were there any internal supports used for the part, or is this part just printed, sort of as as is from the designer? Yeah. So the the images that were shown um, is exactly how it was printed. So no in, no internal supports. The only support that was added was down to the to the base plate. So we had a little bit of a stock um, to cut through when we were removing it off of the build plate itself. And there were a couple of questions on cost. And I think, uh, Rashik, you had an initial comment that this would typically be something like $30,000, $80,000. Um, and maybe, Matt, you could comment a little bit. For the printing itself, I mean, would we be north of that or south of that? I, I, don't, I know you can't quote an exact number, but to the degree that you can kind of provide some directional guidance. Yeah, I think in general, we'd be significantly less than $30,000. Um, and that's on our Sapphire printer. So keeping in mind that's two one kilowatt lasers um, operating in unison, uh, things start to get significantly more interesting uh, when we get into our XC printer where we've now increased our, our melting capacity essentially 4X by going to the eight one kilowatt lasers um, and having a larger build volume. So you, you can both print more parts and print parts faster, um, which is, which is really interesting and starts to change the dynamic uh, of, of the economics, if you will, of some of the parts we've been looking at previously and, and will look at in the future. All right, awesome. Well, I noticed we are up on time and I do wanna give a little bit of time for closing remarks from our speakers. So uh, Rashid, could you kind of kick us off some closing remarks from you um, any final thoughts? Well, um, 
thank you very much for for this opportunity will treaty and uh, and I'm, I'm sure yeah, this is this is just a starting point where we can uh, we can find out like uh, how, what kind of uh, complex structures um in various industries could be could be manufactured um finding the right application is the key for it manufacturing and this is one 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 step further um and hope that we will be will be uh, doing uh, exploring more and more uh, uh, other industries and other uh, uh, applications uh, together to 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 see where where the how we can bring this whole technology forward as a group awesome sunil same question to you yeah so uh, i i really like what we've done here with uh, velo and uh, cgs uh, the last webinar that we did with Velo had a static mixer and this is a drill head we're trying to showcase different areas of applications where additive can make difference and show that it's here meaning it's here as a viable product instead of uh, something that's imaginary and futuristic uh, we, we want to hear from you about specific industry concerns for applications around this so we could um, show you the capabilities because we're kind of using this as a canvas uh, to, to paint with our technologies, combined technologies on. And um, we, would, we would like to see you successful using these things and, and make your, um, um, get you your dream product. So um, all kinds of feedback, welcome. Thanks, Matt, final words. Sure, so I think from our perspective, the kind of the holy grail of additive manufacturing is having designers design parts for function and exactly what they need to do. Um, and, and our mission at Velo is to enable them to create those components without compromising their designs um, with support structures or changing geometries or things like that. So seeing kind of that exact uh, approach come to life through this engagement and this drill bit, um, it really starts to shine the light on what is possible with additive and, and where we could be going by you know, opening up these design spaces and, and not having to compromise on the design so that engineers and designers can truly get um, their design intent uh, components and, and applications out in the field. Nice, thank you. And if we didn't get to your question or you have, want to follow on with an engineer, please feel free to reach out directly. Uh, go ahead and do it right now. Info at velo3d.com. Uh, I'll, I'll be able to see that and I can direct it to the right person or we can have a conversation offline. Uh, really interested in carrying this forward. Uh, thank you very much. Great job, speakers. Thank you, audience, for joining us today. A fantastic session. Really excited about this one. Mm -hmm.